production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, it's an all-feature story edition of our show. See how a Midwest photographer is documenting women in agriculture under the name Farm Her. In our Southern Gardening segment today, ornamental peppers. They're true peppers and they're too pretty to keep in your vegetable garden. You'll want them around the house. In the Food Factor, school lunches. We'll have some ways to get your kids looking forward to lunchtime. Our first feature story today is a look back at last year's Mississippi Gourd Festival. Gourds are still useful, but now they're works of art. And it's an opportunity to really express yourself. And you can do anything to a gourd you can do to a piece of wood. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Today it's an all feature story edition of our show. Coming up next weekend is the sixth annual Mississippi Gourd Festival. It takes place Friday and Saturday, September 18th and 19th at the Smith County Ag Complex in Raleigh. To whet your appetite for this year's festival, we're going to return you to last year's. Gourds used to be prized for their utility. There's evidence of their use as far back as 10,000 BC. In the present day, the Mississippi Gourd Society is tapping into the plant's history, unique shape, and its versatility, and what it offers for art and functionality. Farm Week's Amy Taylor visited the 2014 festival. When you think of what gourds are used for, the first thing that comes to mind is probably birdhouses. But over the past several years, gourders, as they're called, have come up with countless new ways to make them into works of art. With the right technique, some gourds don't even look like gourds. Paul Grubbs, chairman of the fifth annual Mississippi Gourd Festival, says they come in almost any shape and size you can imagine. There are many different varieties of gourds. Uh, we only have a fraction of those that are available for our display here, but uh, they're fun to grow. People love to just watch them. I go out every day and look at them and see how they've changed. Gourds have been around for thousands of years. Man has used them as tools and as uh, vessels for thousands of years. The different shapes and different varieties determine what the use of the gourd is. Additionally, Grubb says gourd art makes great gifts for anyone for every occasion. There's something for everyone in, in, in a crafted gourd. There's uh, Christmas themed painted gourds. There are stained gourds that uh, they make uh, Christmas ornaments for the tree. One of the new artistic styles is etching designs into the gourd. Wood burning is also extremely popular, and there's even a leathering technique using leather dye. Additionally, gourds can be designed using any theme you can think of, and they even make great musical instruments. One of the unexpected uses is to make them into lamps, hanging light fixtures, and even jack-o'-lanterns. Grubb says planting and harvesting gourds is similar to growing watermelons or pumpkins. The difference is, when harvested properly, gourds can last for years to come. Mississippi Gourd Society outgoing president Susan Byra explains the process. You plant in spring and uh, they mature, the vine will die in the fall, and you can leave the gourds on the vine all winter or you can pick them up and store them where air circulation can get to them. You don't want them inside the house because part of the way the gourd cures is to actually evaporate all the um, water inside of it and it creates mold on the outside of the gourd. Gourds must be set on a dry surface to cure until the shell is dry and hard. Never cut or drill into a gourd that hasn't cured. Susan Byra and Paul Grubbs talk about the techniques they like to use. I try to shape some of them sometimes with uh, different products like uh, use some lumber to make a square gourd instead of a round gourd. And it's an opportunity to really express yourself. And you can do anything to a gourd you can do to a piece of wood. Furthermore, probably one of the biggest mysteries of gourd design is how to actually tie one in a knot. Glenn Burkhalter with Gourds by Glenn and Carolyn answers the question about this phenomenal craft. <laughs> 
I bet I've been asked that 10,000 times in the last 15 years. <laughs> so I've kind of got that down pat, I think. Um, the knot itself, you have to do it when it's real tiny gourd. The gourd is there, and when it's blossomed about three days after the bloom with a little gourd on it, and when it's hot and humid, and the hotter the better, and the more humid the better. So around two o'clock in the afternoon, take a small gourd, and let's let the gourd itself hang over a leaf or a vine or a wire and bend itself for 24 hours. You know, it'll do that naturally and it's not gonna break itself. You go back the next day and you do the loop. You get the little gourd down through the loop. Go back the third day and slide that little gourd down to the neck is sticking out of the loop. The first time you try it, you're probably gonna break 10 out of 10. But if you keep trying it, you'll get the hang of it. Additionally, Burke Halter explains how he also makes gourds look twisted. I use stockings from pantyhose to wrap these gourds and make them twist. And at least they mean, you know, I, I, I collect them. One year I used 125 pairs of pantyhose. <laughs> to celebrate the evolution of crafting gourds, the Mississippi Gourd Society has been hosting the Gourd Festival since 2010. Susan Byra tells the story of how Mississippi started its own society. I had a friend of mine who uh, was teaching me how to do pine needle rims on gourds and gourd work. And we went to the gourd artist gathering in Cherokee, North Carolina. I decided that, you know, there were too many good gourd artists in Mississippi that we needed our own society. So there was a friend of ours who had a gourd festival at her, a private one at her place. And so in 2007, I set up a tent and a table and I started taking names. And we formed the Gourd Society in September of 2007. In addition to hosting the festival, Mississippi Gourd Society keeps an updated website, Facebook page, and sends a newsletter to its members in January and July. Furthermore, the festival offers classes to those who want to learn the craft. Byra explains how the techniques for classes are chosen. You just have to come up with a uh, technique that you think people would be interested in. Uh, and when we send out the call for teachers, we evaluate, you know, whether we think it's old hat or something new. And we're always, you know, we like the, the, the tried and true stuff, but we also like to have a new technique or two each time. With so much interest growing for this craft, it seems there's no end to what you can do with a gourd. Whether you like trendy items, intricate woodworking, chic modern art pieces, or beautiful wood stains, there's something for everyone in gourd art. From Raleigh, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. You can watch this story again on our Farm Week website, our Facebook page, or YouTube. Now, the 2015 Gourd Festival will be held Friday and Saturday, September 18th and 19th in Raleigh. The hours are 8 to 5 both days. Admission is $2, children 12 and under free. There will be early bird uh, gourd craft classes on Friday the 18th. The festival is always held the third weekend of September. You can get in touch with the Mississippi Gourd Society at their website, mississippigourdsociety.org. They're also on Facebook. We'll have that information on our website, farmweek.msucares.com. Now, Layton, I want to say if you're not living in Mississippi, there are gourd societies everywhere. So get on the mm. web, check it out, and uh, chances are there's somebody in your state that's into gourds, and you can you can do it as well. The variety of sizes is truly amazing. The <laughs> shapes. <laughs> well, I'm amazed at some of the, uh, the, uh, the depth of the craftsmanship. Oh, yeah. A lot of, lot of hours go into that. Thanks, artists. Well, time for our trivia quiz today on Farm Week, and this question concerns a fruit we love to eat in the South, peaches. Here is the question. What is the top peach producing state in the nation? Is it California, Georgia, New Jersey, or South Carolina? We will have the answer after today's Food Factor segment. Gardeners love to have long lasting color in their landscapes. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us how ornamental peppers provide some hot color for your yard. One of my newest favorite groups of plants for a hot summer and fall, and yes, I did say fall, are ornamental peppers. Today I'm at the North Mississippi Research and Extension Center in Verona taking a look at their trial beds. Ornamental peppers begin setting fruit as the temperatures start to heat up and will keep producing through the fall season. 
It seems like ornamental peppers are continually in flower, which means it's very common to have multitudes of peppers in various stages of coloration. Let's take a look at a few in the trials. This first pepper is April Fool's Day. The fruit are displayed pointing upwards in a tangle of long pods that resemble a joker's hat. The colors range from purple and mature to a bright orangey red. This next pepper comes with darker foliage and is called conga. The roughly triangular fruits start out as purple and mature to an intense red. Jigsaw ornamental pepper is interesting as the fruit plays a secondary role. The real star is the foliage with its white, lavender, purple, and green colorations. The Cubana ornamental peppers display their fruit on top of the bright green foliage. The fruit remind me of colorful marbles with combinations of at least six different colors. Ornamental peppers are versatile plants with a range of sizes from short and compact to tall and bushy varieties. MSU researchers are evaluating ornamental peppers as well as other groups of plants at five trial sites all across Mississippi. Email me for more information. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Gary says ornamental peppers can be used for eating and cooking, but be warned, they are usually very hot. Back to school is in full swing now, and your kids may already be getting tired of the school lunches you pack for them each day. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension gives us some tips on making school lunches fun and healthy. Your child's lunch doesn't have to be boring or stressful, but with a little bit of planning, lunch can be the highlight of their day. When preparing lunches, stock your work area with sandwich bags, reusable containers, plastic spoons and forks, napkins, and handy wipes. Now for the fun, use cookie cutters to create fun shapes from bread or thick cuts of lunch meat and cheese. Pack small portions of raw veggies along with containers of various dips, salad dressing, or even hummus. Experiment with new sandwich ideas by using different types of bread. Or try a tortilla rolled up and cut into slices. Let your child help with new lunch creations and choose from the items you've pre-selected. This will encourage them to eat their entire lunch and benefit from a good balance of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Finally, leave a note or stickers to let your child know you're thinking of them. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Making school lunches the night before allows for more creativity and variety, and it keeps you from getting into a rut. Well, it's time for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. Again, we wanted to know what state provides the most peaches in the United States. And according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, California is still the nation's number one peach producer in spite of its drought. The others on the list are numbers two, three, and four. Now, California raised 70% of the nation's peaches in 2015, more than 1.1 billion pounds. South Carolina is a distant second at 138 million pounds. Georgia is third, 78 million pounds, and it might surprise you to know New Jersey is fourth with 48 million pounds. We're going to pause for a break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. The number of women engaged in large and small-scale agriculture is growing. Farm Her is taking their pictures. You know what, Daddy? I think these may be the best tomatoes we've ever grown. I think you're right. Hey, I bet we sell all of them before lunch. Man, look at that. Let me get four boxes. So, how was everything? Did you enjoy those stuffed tomatoes? It's delicious. Are these locally grown? Yep, I picked them up at the farmer's market this morning. Now, before we get back to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. We have a couple of vegetable events coming up in the next month. 
The fall flower and vegetable tour takes place Saturday, September 26. The location is the North Mississippi Research and Extension Center of Mississippi State. That's on Highway 145 South at Verona. The hours are 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Tours will be conducted of the home demonstration garden area and the commercial horticulture research area. There will also be children's activities. The 42nd Annual Ornamental Horticulture Field Day will be held at the South Mississippi Branch Experiment Station of Mississippi State University. That's Thursday, October 1st. Doors open at 9 a.m. There's a $10 admission fee, but that includes your lunch. This event remi remains popular, though, because homeowners and commercial horticulture growers learn useful information at this event. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. It's no secret, America's farmers are getting older, even as the younger, number of younger farmers has grown slightly. Less than 15% of U.S. farms list women as the principal operator. Anyone who's lived and worked on a farm recognizes the pivotal role played by women, and one Midwestern photographer is documenting their important contributions. Market to Market's Laurel Bauer Bergmeier explains. It is a fact that the majority of farmers in the U.S. are white males, yet a growing number of women are joining their ranks. Women currently run about 14 percent of the nation's farms, up from only 5 percent in the 1980s. A large number of those operations run primarily by women tend to be smaller and more diverse. Even though there are grain and livestock operations among them, many are part of the growing organic and local foods movements. While women have always been an important part of agriculture, photographer Margie Geiler Alanese felt they were mostly undocumented. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. Watching this commercial about American farmers during the 2013 Super Bowl inspired Geiler Alanese. It was this moment where I was like, I dealt with a lot of farm imagery throughout my career and and you know you just whatever you see in in any magazine or publication that you pick up and it's never you just never saw it so um i had this kind of aha moment as silly as that might sound i woke my husband up literally at like two in the morning and i was like i know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna start photographing women farmers or women in agriculture not just farmers you know ranchers whatever um, in, in all types of agriculture. And the project Farm Her was born. Farm Her documents the important role that women play in the agriculture system. Through photography, Geiler Alanese captures women producers running diverse farming operations. Every single time I am super impressed by them, I will tell you that. They, the, they have a work ethic and they work so hard and um, one thing that I, I will say I see every single time is that they have a passion and a love for what they do. Um, it, it's hard work day in, day out. There's no vacations, there's no breaks, um, you know, and so they love what they do. And I see that time and time again. Landy McFarlane Livingston is one of Geiler Alanese's subjects. She is a sixth generation farmer and a fourth generation Angus breeder. McFarland Livingston is co-owner of Hoover Angus Farm, a 400-head cattle ranch located in southern Iowa. I really love Angus cattle. I think it's in my blood. I really do. Uh, my great-grandfather started the Angus herd 86 years ago. And, um, you know, I've been born and raised in it. I love the lifestyle. I love the genetics. I love the, the EPDs, what are expected progeny differences that help us make better beef, and I, I just love that. I love um, looking out on, on a pasture of cows and, and seeing them be happy, and so it's, it's in my blood, I love it. Well, come here, girls. 
McFarland Livingston's operation sells Angus genetics worldwide. It is one of the oldest purebred Angus herds in the nation, and she is proud to be part of Farm Her to showcase that. Margie's images uh, that I've seen of me are really, um, they're things that I wouldn't have, have expected. I mean, I, I know I, I do my chores every day, and she took pictures of me just doing my chores, going about my business. But she has a really unique ability to capture things. And when I looked at those pictures, I was like, wow, that is pretty cool, you know? And that's pretty cool for the consumer to see the things that we do on a daily basis that we don't even think about. I don't even think about, but um, they're part of what we do. One, two, three. Yeah, that works sometimes. <laughs> that's a girl. Lois Reichert is another of Geiler Alanese's subjects. She's been running a dairy goat operation in rural Knoxville, Iowa for more than eight years. Reichert's small herd of nearly 15 head is made up primarily of La Mancha goats. They're personalities. They're, they are, each has a very individual and fun personality. Um, they're, uh, I like to say they're a combination between dogs and cats. They're, they have the independence of cats, but the friendliness and most of the time desire to please of dogs. <laughs> um, they're just fun, they're loving. Um, I don't know, I still, every day, the most satisfaction I get in my day is looking out and looking at my healthy, happy animals. That's, it, I don't know why, it just does something for me. <laughs> Reichert makes and sells cheeses from the goat milk her animals produce. She sells most of her cheese at the Des Moines Farmer's Market, but also ships a weekly supply to a distributor in Chicago. While it was hard being photographed at first, Reichert says Geiler Alanese is good at putting a person at ease. It was really embarrassing at first, because <laughs> especially the great big picture of my face. I, what I really loved were the images she captured of what I do, of the goats and, like I told her, the brushes and the things like that. I was blown away the first time I saw her pictures. Um, they were not at all what I expected. Um, so after the initial embarrassment, <laughs> um, it's really been delightful because it's like I explained to people that, that this captures who I really am and what I do. Geiler Alanese says Farm Her also gives women a voice. Many people who visit the website communicate with one another. If it gives people um, comfort in that there's other pe others out there doing what they're doing, um, I hear that all the time, that they, it's living in a rural area and working um, by yourself is isolating, and so seeing those other women or having that connection to them, um, just visually, is, is a sense of community. Having begun in 2013, Farm Her is still in its infancy. To date, Geiler Alanese has photographed 32 women farmers mostly in Iowa and the Midwest. In the future, she hopes to travel nationwide into other countries to profile many more women. I feel personally that um, from, a, from a photographer standpoint, but I'm so happy with how they're turning out and I feel like they're actually showing what I see or you know what you would see when you're on a farm. I, I think they show that and, and so that makes me excited. Um, every time I, I take more pictures and look at them, I'm like, yay, this is what I wanted to, to have happen. For Market to Market, I'm Laurel Bauer Bergmeier. And you can watch this story again on a Farm Her on our Farm Week website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch Farm Week stories on our Farm Week USA Facebook page and on YouTube. And we will have a link to the Mark to Market website where you can see the original story as well as read the script. We're also available at twitter.com slash farmweek. So artists, that project now over two years old, I guess, and uh, it really does look at those images. They really do make give you a feeling of you're there with them. Well, and another thing too is the fact that, you know, they tend to be smaller operations normally, mm -hmm. and but that's, that works in with the many women's abilities to, to work the animals and such as that. So I think it's a, it's a great idea and hopefully it's giving inspiration to other women. Because I know even here in the Startville area, 
you know, we have uh, several women that are running blueberry operations and such as that. Uh, so I, I hope it really does help to inspire. One thing we might go back to a little earlier in the show, talking about the Gourd Festival. I plan on being there. My mom lives about 20 miles from there. I think she would really enjoy it. So I'm planning on picking her up and taking her to the Gourd Festival. So hopefully we'll see uh, some of you there come up and say hello because we'd like to well, I to think meet there's no, no doubt there will be quite a crowd for that event. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go ahead and look towards next week. We're at the end of this farm week. Now deer are known for their beauty, but they can cause a lot of damage when their numbers get high. On our next Farm Week show, you will visit peach grower Tom McCullough of the Batesville. A longtime local food producer, McCullough had to fence in his 25-acre orchard to keep deer from destroying it. And the Food Factor breakfast cereal will have some ways to make it a nutritious part of your day. In Southern Gardening, Colossal Caladiums. They're big and they are beautiful. Well, if you'd like further information on a Farm Week story or you've got a story to suggest to us, you need to get in touch with us. You can write us. Our address is Farm Week Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi, 39762. That's Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi, 39762. Our telephone number, 662-325-2262. You can also contact us through your county office of the Mississippi State University Extension. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good week.